All right. Good morning. Like the good afternoon, if that's where you're at, or a good middle of the night, even. Um, this is the 56th EOF and Blenders call on the 21st of August, 2024. Um, nothing was put in advance on the agenda except for a few items from last week that I just put on, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Um, so we'll just go through these as we get, get to them. If there's any other, are there any other items people feel we need to talk about that aren't expressed in the standard ones or the fuzzing? and DevNet forwarding this stuff. Okay. If you think there's stuff, just drop it in the chat as we get along. Um, client updates, I see the usual suspects, um, Nethermind's uh, here this week as well. Um, basically, EVM1, I don't think we have anything exciting to talk about. EVM1, do you have anything? Uh, we actually found a bug in, 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 in header parser. Uh, today. So that's one more, one more thing I coming from father. What was the bug? Uh, EDM1 accepted uh, multiple subcontainer sections because oh. they are op optional so that they were kind of handled differently, uh, slightly differently. But uh, so you could put like O3 as the Subcontainer section in the header, and then another one, and so header was kind of parsing. Uh, it's complicated. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I totally get what, what triggered. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I, 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 we, we, we couldn't find a, a case where that could be exploited, but it's definitely serious issue. Um, but apparently, Father has not found anything. With this back end that even one would consider uh fully fully valid uh US, right? So maybe it's possible to construct some, but it's pretty difficult. Um so I think we we didn't approach it more, uh, but we'll have a fix and some some test cases, but uh yeah. Okay. Yeah, probably finally hit the duplicate string and hit the right value after a week of fuzzing. I mean, that's why you just let the fuzzers run. So, so, um, so, so because I mean, this is something I maybe I'll try to address later. It's uh, it's not directly that the fuzzer has found it. It's just I I was implementing fuzz a mutator for for the fuzzer. Um, ah, and. Apparently, the mutation was kind of going wrong, uh, according to the like my assumption, and I needed to manually inspect some examples that were kind of broken. And okay. then I found it. So that's why I I I don't see. Uh, we, that's why I I say we couldn't find an example that would be if you consider a whole UF. Would be uh, considered it successful on EVM side and like obviously wrong on the other side, but maybe it's possible. Um, and I think weakness of this fuzzing comes from the fact I only compare like the boolean value of of validation, um, not like specific error codes, right? So uh, I plan to so what happens if multiple error codes trigger on the same one? I mean, is it a fuzzing failure if multiple <laughs> clients get the correct but different failure reason? Well, you need to kind of handle that in the code somehow. Um, I have some idea how to how to. Yeah, I mean, so what I want to have in mind uh, for like sort of semi standardization would be instead of individual error codes. Uh, I want to have some kind of error category. So for example, like the error comes from like invalid header or like a specific code section that would be like difference. And I think that would help like to distinguish what what different implementations think about code. But I, I will write an issue about it probably for next meeting or something. Okay. Um, obviously I can try to map <clears throat> Uh, error codes coming from different implementation, but uh, I didn't try to do it yet. So it would be like okay. kind of 
you need to, to, to kind of implement some rules like this error on this implementation means this one or like one of these on the other one. It's it's probably not like one to one match. Uh, and and I don't think we want to standardize specific error codes right now. So uh I think that there's some work to do here, but uh yeah, I, I don't think that needs attention from everyone right now. Okay. Um, yeah, I think a couple of the bugs that Fuzzing found for Beisu a couple weeks ago had to do with excess data in the subcontainer. Um, if the subcontainer was had extra data at the end, um, it shouldn't validate. It should be a perfect fit. So, yeah. Um, never mind. Ben Adams, do you have anything? To uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, just a question on these further test files. Are they being added as tests? When the fuzzer discovers something, are they being added to regular tests? Yes, I have an ugly PR I'm trying to massage into something submittable where I'm getting a lot of these failures I found into new tests. Um, typically, they indicate a failure of test coverage when I find through fuzzer. So, yeah, definitely adding tests for those. Cool. Um, so, it was highlighted to us that we weren't testing the uh, EOF container tests. Um, we've added that in, but we're failing them because um, we do <coughs> a recursive validation and we um, we blow our stack. So we're reworking how we're doing that to to not not be recursive. Um, okay. That's where we are. At the I also found your tests and I turned off that blow up stack test. Um, and yeah, that's, there's still a few other, mostly um, boundary conditions. I don't know if you want to just do a catch at the end or check them ahead of time. That's that's another thing to, to figure out, but yeah. Yeah, we'll pick that up as part of the um, reworking the... Um, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're sort of redesigning it. So. Okay. But yeah, it's I've also got a, a fuzzer that I wrote in my own side repo. And uh, another mind does participate in fuzzing, but um, I guess one of the points, um, you really need to be 100% fuzzing because the initial corpus is the unit tests, and uh, you're going to get a lot of fuzzing findings near the initial corpus. Um, I don't see um, Reth or Geth or Ethereum JS on the call. Is that correct? Um, Get's got some fuzzing findings that are outstanding too, as well as um, some state test failures. Um, cool. So spec updates. Um, where were we with any spec updates? Are we pretty much closing the door on non-emergency spec updates? Is that where we're at? Oh, sorry. Uh, you got something? Yeah, there was some... Um, I, I don't think I was on the last... Cool. But there were those, that open question on um, some of the previous opcodes. Has that been covered off? Previous opcodes? Like opcodes, like whether to allow oh, okay. code, code length and things like that. Yeah, I think where the vibe was last week was um, we're just not going to add them right now because there is an escape hatch. You can just call out to a regular contract to get um, the seven seven twenty one to the seven the seven twenty one and the eleven fifty fives. Um, you can make a booster contract that will return it. Same with ext code copy. You can make another small booster contract to call it. Um, and one of the the philosophies there is once we put it in, we can never really take it out again. So we're erring on the side of having the option to change it later. And one of the reasons I think we're also erring towards not putting it in um, is it's leaning into the future of account abstraction where everything's going to be a contract. Uh, there are no EOAs. So checking code length isn't, get, isn't going to get you any information because everything's a contract, which actually helps out 1155 and 721 um, because they'll try and do the calls they need and the calls will fail. So that will actually help out in that world. Um, as far as EXT code copy, um, there is was discussion for EXT data copy, which is something we will probably revisit once we ship this first version. 
Um, I think that was mentioned on Twitter. Um, but I, and I think we were against changing the, um, there wasn't enough consensus to change the return codes was another option that was discussed, but it never developed consensus around it. So we're going to stick with what's in there. So that's the, the say of the spec is we thought about it and we don't feel we must change it. So I think that's the mode we're in right now. Okay. Can you go over again um, how the account abstraction thing helps 721 and 1155? You said something about you will make a call and it will fail. Right. So the plan is um, if account abstraction gets their way, uh, this is one of their, not gets their way, this is what the current plan of record. I don't know how soon it's going to be. Um, but when they try an account abstraction, every single other account um, that is an EOA will get an account that looks like um, it's uh, that the action behaves with 721 with, with, with EOA validation. Um, they'll put a contract in there that'll read the signature, validate the signature, and approve it and return it and accept transfers. Um, but because it's a contract, if you call it with one of the functions it doesn't understand, it will return failure. Um, so that's one of the changes they're looking into for account abstraction. Um, but, you know, that we, we might look into, you know, we have more time to discuss it and talk both sides of it. Um, I don't know if we're going to do these in Osaka or Amsterdam, um, but EOF version 1.1 or whatever we call it, um, we're going to start looking at some of these minor addition changes that don't require breaking. And one of the candidates is definitely is contract slash EXT code size. Um, EXT data copy is another candidate that we're going to discuss. Um, and I think those are the two um, biggest things that we pushed for complexity reason, um, because we don't have to break anything now with them. I mean, taking them out is where we need to start out with, but putting them back in doesn't break anything per se. So that's what, how we came to that position. Okay. So I just want to say like, from the perspective of authoring a library, like a Solidity library, even though it, it, it is technically possible to, to do the escape hatch, it seems like you would need to hard code an, an address for the um, auxiliary contract that does what you want. And yes. Like, so there's, yeah. Yeah, so, so I just want to say like use... the address depends on, on the chain. There is no reliable method for deterministic uh, cross-chain addresses. Um, so it's just there like really- There is one that's deployed to most L2s. There is a, a L2 create two deployer that's on most L2s. The minimal one, there was an EIP for it. Um, let me see. Right, but it's not it's not solidity. It's not everywhere that you can do solidity. So, or EVM right. even. So it's, it's just like, it is technically feasible. Um, like, I don't know if, for example, Open Zeppelin would, would be able to use that technique. And so it would there, there would be contracts that are like not EOF um, compatible. And so like, yeah, I just, it doesn't seem like a good near term future. Um, and personally, the account abstraction argument I don't find it convincing either because like I don't I feel like there there are no concrete plans for that yet and, and it could change a whole lot. So but I don't know. I I just wanted to get that opinion on record at least. Okay. Um Ben, you have something to add? Yeah, for like a booster contract, you can do the self signed um transaction from like an unknown address and then deploy that to get the same contract address from every single L2. Right. But as I think well the concern well. there is, can Open Zeppelin count on that? Is that a quality gate they want to put on their downstream users? Yeah, and it would be a new uh, thing because there, there's nothing like that already. So this would be a new decision to be made. And the method that you just mentioned it's not 100% reliable either because you, you have gas um, numbers in there, gas prices. and um, But it is true well, that there are these factories deployed in many places. 
Yeah, because the factories you can you can just call. I um I can't find the uh the default address for some of these, but there are some where you call in and does it via create too. And those were deployed by it, but because of the gas differences, it might need to be a pre-deploy, which is what makes it messy. So um I mean this is this is the feedback we need to make sure that we get this in, if not now, definitely in the next fork where we're gonna do some EVM updates. Uh, just on the is contract, the, one of the slight issues with not having an is contract is a lot of the, uh, was it EIP 618? I can't remember. Uh, the support thing where you call into another contract. A lot of those have the short, short circuit where, you know, they test con <clears throat> whether the addresses um a contract before calling it so you know is this um an nft oh, sorry is this a contract that doesn't support receiving nfts there's like a, a stat erc standard for that and you generally right. check wh whether it's a contract that you're calling first before you ask whether it supports the uh, make the call I know what you, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember the number offhand. Is is it is it a finalized one? Uh well it's in it's in the NFT contracts. Um but yeah. Um because I have, you know, do you support receiving this? Um so if it's an EOA, you just send them the NFT, which is the is contract yes. test. And <clears throat> if it's a contract, then you query the contract to see whether it supports um doing it. But I mean that's, yeah, I think that's, that's more of I mean, a more of a gas thing than anything else. It, it's it's but it's you actually can a just it off. Thing. Go ahead. I think it's it's like it's not really gas. I think it's part of the transfer semantics. Um and I think that's the main motivation here that we have found to having this ability, right? And it's like, it's built into 7.12, the main NFT standard. Oh, sorry, 7.21. 7.21. Yeah, the taken receiver. 165. There was a six in it. Just to, to be clear, it's 721 does not use 165 for the support, NFT support detection. Right, but lots of people will be using 165 outside and inside, and they want to make sure it's uh You don't really need it for it? this. For this ERC, you don't yeah. really need that. Because you're going to get zero bytes return data, so it's just going to fail the check anyway. And then, okay, then it becomes a gas thing for sure, yes. Mm -hmm. the optimization but that can be omitted so yeah. um maybe like if if i was to make this decision i would like to see like a full explanation of how exactly the the aea argument goes um like 
because we assume this will happen, then um, we want this outcome in the in the, in the immediate next hard fork, right? To like, is it that we want contracts to start failing so that the community starts doing something earlier before the transition to AA, or is it like, what exactly is the argument there? I would like to to see that stated if I was to make that decision. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think I think most of a lot of like the key um epsilon people are still out on August vacations. So I'll bring this up in the chat room as well. Okay, Is so that on the, the code. Go ahead. On the eighth R and D Discord. Yes, it would be an EVM group. Okay. Any other spec updates? Is that the hottest one out there? Are there any that aren't as hot that we should discuss? Okay. Testing updates. So testing is um, reaching a very important milestone here coming up shortly. Um, on ACD last week, uh, EOF got slotted into DevNet 4. By DevNet 4, what we really mean is DevNet 3 is 7702 and however many other DevNets they need to get it right. And then the next feature that's going to be put into DevNets is going to be EOF, which um, assuming 7702 nails it on, uh, DevNet 3, then DevNet 4 would be when we would be in. And that was at least four weeks from last week. So it's at least three weeks from today, as soon as three weeks. Um, it might slip out if 7702 slips out, but we might be looking at needing to be ready to get at least a couple of clients up there um, within three weeks. Um, so I guess the... Uh, The big thing that's coming up is we need to start doing what's necessary to merge the rest of Prague in and seeing that we can um, activate it um, based on activate it straight from Prague. I think one of the first steps is just to make it the, the test default to Prague. Um, Right now, the latest release that we have, it contains both EOF on top of Cancun and on top of Prague. But I think we should force that the next releases only ship from Prague um, just to make sure that the rest of the clients are uh, up to date with their branches of EOF on top of Prague. Um, so right now, the Prague releases for EOF, they are like uh, this extra fork. Um, but I think I think we should, uh, first of all, start with the tests uh, now being filled with Prag only. So no no more Prag uh, EIP7692, just Prag. And that should activate EOF on tests uh, yeah, for upcoming releases. Um, OK. And that'll start next week's release yeah i think so i i first wish to merge 7702 tests uh make that stable and then we can start working on on top of that uh uh working version of 7702 tests we can just start working on uh migrating everything you have related into Prague. but i think that's going to be extremely easy because it's just a one line change um what also what this will activate so right now with 7702 tests we have we, I, I have been uh, very careful to 
also consider EOF into the test cases. And the nice thing is that um, we've uh, basically parameterized all 7702 tests to also uh, fill under uh, under EOF uh, uh, smart contracts. Uh, what this means is that once uh, EOF uh, uh, the the test work uh, for Prag includes EOF, all of these 7702 tests will automatically update to also fill uh, for EOF. So that's 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 a good thing. Um, but yeah, I think we can do this once uh, 7702 makes it into the into into a tests uh, execution spec test branch, and uh, sorry main. And then we can start working on on just bringing EOF and making sure that all the tests fill correctly. There are no issues, and if there are any issues, I I will just try to, um, uh, yeah, just just fix them to 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 get the EOF tests ready. Okay. So yeah, that's probably a big thing that we need to be aware of. It should be. I mean, yeah, I think every client will need to support, do some change because we've all got our custom forks for it. Um, okay. Anything else from the test team that we need to be aware of and ready for? Maybe just that there was a release uh, last week, but uh, it doesn't contain anything major. It just contains both uh, uh, Prague and Cancun uh, really, uh, fixtures, but there's not nothing of highly relevant relevant from there. Um yeah I think that's 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 about it. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, we're also doing you have container fuzzing. Um, EVM one has a fuzzer. Um, Basic has a fuzzer. Um, but I think the one thing that we need to be sure of is we only get the best results if we pass all the EEST tests um, because the at least in Basic and I expect in EVM one um, the tests become the initial corpus. Uh, if you're not familiar how fuzzing works, they take stuff that works and they mess with it until it doesn't, and it's going to get really close to the ones, so if we keep messing up broken tests, we're gonna get lots of signal from the broken tests. Um, but my results line up so far with EVM one's results, um, Besu, Geth, and EVM one um, can run a long-term fuzzing um, without any uh, without any differences or changes between any of them. They all pass the same, they all fail the same. Um, for Besu, um, the the fuzzer only generates a valid EOF about oh, one third of one percent of the time. Ninety nine point seven percent of the test cases are invalid, so we're really getting an exercise of all the code validation shortcuts. Um, but we also need to start up, and this is something I'm going to start writing up hopefully this week. EOF execution fuzzing. Um, and what's going to be difficult with the execution fuzzing um, is invalid EOF containers provide zero value to the fuzzing because we're actually needing it to validate and then execute it. Um, I'm not expecting we're going to get a lot of hits because there's already legacy fuzzing that goes on uh, very regularly. Um, Martin and Marius um, keep running in the background and they always ping people when they mess stuff up in their new releases. Um, but the... Uh, um, because we're exercising most of the same operations, we get a lot of the same coverage, but there's operations they don't cover. Anything that's unique to EOF won't get coverage. Um, stuff like the data operations, uh, swap end, dupe end, exchange. So those we need to get um, into some, some execution fuzzing. And I'm going to look into this week to see what it's going to take to build a guided one with Basu. Um, I might just fall back and build new generators on Guido's. Um, I'm not sure what I'm really getting into on this. Um, anyone else have any experience writing execution fuzzers or working with them? Epsilon? Um, I have some with uh, Go EVM Lab. Um, 
I'm also in touch with with Guido, but I never actually tried to run this one. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to get it to where it's guided by at least one or two of the clients. I think we'll get higher signal that way. Because um, at the very least, um, when it's guided, if we get a new hit that everyone passes, that tells us that maybe we have a um, a new uh, bug we need to work on. So a new, a new test case. Okay. So I think those were the ones on my mind. Um, would anything else anyone wants to bring up? Powell, do you still have your mic on? No, no. I just want to throw a reminder that we can we have the testing matrix that uh, the clients can uh, confirm or fill out. It's right now is pretty. Uh, um, Bad guesses. So if anything's off there, please. Uh, um, would would there be any interest in an automated form of this, where all the clients have their current test run against it, um, against the current EST tests? Would there be interest in that? Um, I don't know how. If that would not be overkill. Because it's not only east, it's also the uh, more manual or informal testing, like the EVM one exported tests. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe one, one one option could be that we run a Hive um, Hive instance. Uh, we have a consumer uh, in Hive, so this is called the consumer engine. That basically just <clears throat> runs the uh, consumer engine. Um, uh, command that we have in East, it just sends engine API requests to the to the to to a running client in Hive. So we have this uh, this nice U, 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 HTML page where it shows all the results. Um, the problem is that we have to first set it up, and the second thing is that it won't test. So I think the I think a lot of the tests are container verification. So most of them. They are not filling into anything, uh, yeah. in 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 this consumer engine format. So I th I think we sh we we are missing a lot of of coverage even if we run this uh, automatically. So ideally, and maybe it's setting up some CI in the in the clients. I think, but yeah. It... Does it run EOF tests? Yeah. The so yeah. So the consumer engine will not run EOF tests because. Uh, it it consumes directly using the client, so it basically spins up a client, then with a certain genesis, and then it fits uh, engine new payload and in purchase with it and all that stuff. So it only works with the valid um, execution uh, UF tests, not with the uh, container validation, which is I think is a big chunk of the tests that we have. Um, so I think yeah. <clears throat> The LECI on the on the on the client side would be better. Still, we can set okay. up we, we can set up Hive if if that's 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 a plus I think. Yeah, because um, I mean we'll get there as part of the release process anyway. Running these tests on Hive, I don't know that we need to push it to the left any. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I've got some scripts. I'll post some of my findings from the scripts. I'm having problems getting the numbers to match up. Different the, the different clients and test tools. Some of them test all the subtests, some of them don't, and the outputs are all different. But at least when you get failures, you, you get a good signal there that if something's failing, you might not get the count right. Okay. Anything else?
Donald, you mentioned that uh, you're working on the um, making proper test cases out of the cases that the father found. Is that correct? You, you um, I have like a, a PR, PR. PR on the side. Yeah, with, with some of them, but not all of them. Uh, that's the PR to East, I presume. Yes. Okay, can you post the link? Because we were also discussing uh, working on this at one point, so let's not duplicate. I haven't posted a PR yet. I'll get that out here uh, okay, before you okay. start work tomorrow, for sure. Right, cool. Uh, so also, if anyone's missing a review, I think I've left comments on most of the open PRs, but if there's any outstanding PR that doesn't have a review and needs a review from me, please just ping me. I will try to get to it. Uh, it's just that I've been very busy with 7702 tests. Uh, but yeah, just please bear with me, ping me if if anything's missing from my side. Cool. Yeah, thank you. All right. If there's no other last words, I'll give everyone. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. If it's okay. I, I have another comment on on spec updates. So I, what the other issue I had raised. Over a month ago, was the the thing about delegate call and how it reverts when delegate calling to non EOF contract. Um, and there, this may introduce a new kind of risk of um, breaking some proxies. Anyway, um, I I kind of understand the rationale. I might be on the camp of okay, let's disallow that, but there. So the question then would be like, is there a way to detect that the delegate call I'm about to make will fail um, or that th this address that I have, I'm not going to be able to delegate call to. And so we had discussed maybe that um, it could be possible to use X, the Xcode hash uh, opcode to detect that by simply uh, seeing that the target that you are, um, that, that the address that you have is an EOF contract. Um, so that was like one of the benefits of re-enabling the EXT code hash opcode. Um, now, I understand, you know, the, the concerns with that. So then it would, but I just wanted to raise like the same concern of like, if you want to use this sort of escape hash uh, booster contract that you mentioned, we sort of have the same concern for library authors. So I feel like it's a similar question. Um, right. In the end, what, yeah, what's the, what was the current vibe about that issue in particular? Mostly I think we were in the process where we need to gather more information, make sure we fix it right. Um, and, and, and information like this um, would be useful. And then when you say we make proxies, you, you say, EOF proxies or legacy proxies in EOF? This would be only EOF proxies. We've, we've already talked about this, by the way. Right. Just, I want to document it. This is the case where someone updates uh, previous EOF implementation to a legacy implementation yes. of an EOF proxy contract. OK. Um. Yeah, I could write it down and post it somewhere. That would that would be good because um, this specific I, case would help us make sure we get the thing the issue right. Yeah. Uh, cut one question I have: um, seventy-seven hundred two delegates. Do we care? Does it matter? Should they should they be transparent? Oh, for EXT code hack. For for and for for proxies, are we okay if we proxy? This is probably a little bit out of EOF scope, but we may as well fix it in EOF if we're going to fix it. Would proxy contracts care if they call into a 7702 proxy? I don't have a strong opinion, but um, I don't see any reason why they would behave differently in, in EOF to, to um, legacy. Right. Hmm. Do you mean uh, an implementation of the proxy would be an EOA with a with a delegation set via 7702? Right. Or... 
Um, is that useful? Do we need that? Do we not need that? Do we just go ahead and go with what they intend, which is it looks like a contract now for all purposes? Yeah, it sounds okay to me. Weird, but it sounds like it, it would be very weird because that would allow the implementation to vanish or just change arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. After the EOA signs another set called the transaction, so it doesn't sound. But that's like not that. an EOF concern. Um, that would be something we need to bring up in the AA chat room and uh, you know um, proceed at your own risk. Yeah. Ben, I'm just I'm just thinking: is there a situation where you could be proxying the other way, so the EOA was an EOF, and you were going trying to proxy through a legacy contract? So the uh, the 7702 wouldn't work, if that makes sense, in all searches. Right. Whereas, <clears throat> I assume you'd want to encourage people to use EOF contracts for um, 7702. Okay. I mean, there was talk of requiring EOF for 7702 as well. That's one thing that was seriously discussed at one point. I'm not sure it's entirely dead. Um, but then would that be a problem if your EOA tried to delegate call into another contract, if that makes sense? That's legacy. Right. And that was debated whether it was a, a feature or a bug. And I think bug the bug camp won out, so that's why it's not in the spec. Okay, that's fine. Um, but as far as getting rid of the delegate call, um, I'm remembering some of the seven, uh, six, seven, eight, zero rules. Um, this self-destruct still operates if it's created in the same transaction. So even though self-destruct is nerfed, it still has visibility in EOF. Um, it's just not as common a case. So I think that's why the delegate call ban is still in place. Yeah, I think that was one of the main, if not the, 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 the most, the strongest reason, yeah. Yeah, that's the reason it got put in the first place, and 6780 didn't change it enough that we can get rid of the delegate call. Okay. So I can write this down um, yeah, and share it do. somewhere to, to get the most visibility possible, because I have written about this before in the if, if Magicians forum, but I feel like that's not maybe where the most eyes are. So you, you can just tell me where I should share for the most visibility. It would be in the Discord ETH R and D EVM channel. Okay. And that entirely opaque sequence of Discord numbers is where it's at. That I just posted in the chat. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, any other issues people want to discuss before we end the call? Okay. Um, next call is in two weeks, same time. ACDs next week. Um, appreciate everyone's work putting into this. Uh, let's try and get those tests up to 100%. Um, so we can get, get a good couple weeks of fuzz again before we shift over to the dev nets. All right. Talk to everyone in a week or two. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.